Hello and welcome to my Management 371 Week 2 Critical Thinking Presentation. This week the question was posed that McGregor published Theory X and Theory Y over 30 years ago. In your opinion, do we still have Theory X managers? I say that we absolutely do. Theory X managers are negative and pessimistic and believe that employees dislike work and need to be closely supervised in order to do their work. In my experience, we called managers like that micromanagers in the sense that they must oversee every aspect of the employee doing their job. A theory Y manager might tell an employee to go over there and clean that table and then leave the employee to his or her own volition to go ahead and clean that table. A theory X manager will tell an employee to get a specific towel, a specific cleaner, tell them exactly how to wipe the table down and will watch them do it while they... Uh, look over their shoulder or they'll come inspect and possibly criticize the cleaning of the table. I currently work two jobs. My full-time job is at a jet engine manufacturer. All of the management there, college educated, and I would soundly say that most of them are theory Y managers in the sense that they do not have to watch over our shoulders as we do work. In my part-time job at the home improvement store, most of the managers there is theory X. There may be a few individuals that have some college education at the home improvement store, but most of them are not. There may be some correlation to the amount of college education that a manager has versus if they are theory X or theory Y, but it may hold a greater correlation to the type of employee each set of managers are supervising. At my full-time job, the average age of employees is roughly 55 years old. At my part-time job, the average age of employees is probably more like 25 to 30 years old. So there's a maturity factor at play here that probably has more to do with it than college education. The next question asked is to select enterprise either Theory X or Theory Y manager you have worked for during my time at the airline. I had a supervisor, let's call him Scott. Scott was a straight up Theory X manager. He spent most of his time going between the different active jobs that were going on and we were as we were working on the airplane, constantly offered his unsolicited opinion on how to do our jobs. He would hide back and kind of watch us and see if we slacked off a little bit. And if we did, he would come jump down our throats. He would follow us into the bathrooms, make sure we did not take too long. He would stand in front of the break room door, prevent anyone from going to break early. And then when break was over, he would stand up, make an announcement, the break is over and it's time to get back to work. Scott would often tell us that he was told that it's his job to make sure that we stayed working all the time and that he was just doing what upper management told him to do. All right, now let me tell you how this ended. One day at our start of work meeting, Scott was yelling about how far behind the schedule we have fallen. Everyone decided that we've had enough. We went to our toolboxes, stood there. Nobody went straight to work. It took a minute for Scott to realize what exactly was going on. He went to each of us, demanded to know what was going on. We replied in the same manner, which was pretty much F off Scott. He became unhinged. He started throwing papers and stuff on the ground, ranting and raving like a lunatic. He went to his office and called the director of maintenance, who was his boss. The director came down from his office and held an emergency meeting with the mechanics minus Scott. So we got a chance to air out our grievances and the director listened. We told the director what Scott said about him being told that it was his job to make sure that we stayed working all the time. The director assured us that he never told Scott that was the case. After the meeting, the director pulled Scott into his office. That evening, Scott was sent home. The next day he came back, but he was no longer our supervisor. He had been demoted back down to just a regular mechanic like the rest of us. Even then, no one wanted to work with him. The supervisor that took his place was way better at it than Scott was. That must have been a hard lesson for Scott to learn. And as a side note, Scott had only been our supervisor for about three or four weeks. So that goes to show how fast things escalated. Question three asks, in my opinion, do I believe that if I use ethical behavior, it will pay off in the long run and give reasons? I believe so. I believe that if I do what I feel is right, and still does not end up with a success, then my conscience is clear. 
I can sleep easy at night knowing that I did the right thing and still failed rather than do something unethical and that ends up in success. In the long run, unethical behavior is always brought to light. It may not be immediate, but it does eventually catch up to you. Next, I'm asked if ethics can be taught and learned. I certainly hope so. I like to think of human beings as blank slates and our upbringing as detrimental as to who we become as adults. So if you're taught ethical behavior as a child, you grow up to be an ethical adult. I like to think that it's a two-way street. You can be taught to cheat and win as a child and grow up and still cheat and win as an adult. Now, I'm not saying that if you were brought up right that you will never become unethical because I am certain this happens all the time. Sometimes the lure of success can be too much and a good person can be tempted to do something unethical. And that the same can be said in reverse. You can be raised to win at all costs but also learn to win the right way as an adult. So what I'm trying to say that is if you're raised right, you have a better chance of being upright and ethical as an adult. If you aren't, there's still chance for you. Finally, I'm asked to determine an ethical, an, an ethical situation in my career and what was the outcome. One night, a few years ago, we were testing engines for production pass off. At shift change, it was stressed to us that this particular engine needed to be up on the dock before we went home. The engine was sold to a customer and the PO date was the very next day. When I got my carryover from the day shift technician, I was told everything was hooked up and we were ready to go start testing. So we ran the entire test and I ran the data through a data reduction program. The program indicated that the engine had past performance specs, which was good because that means the engine is ready to be sold. When I went out to unhook, and when I went out to the test cell to unhook the engine, I found one pressure measurement not to be hooked up. Uh, this particular pressure management is, measurement is detrimental to engine performance, so it needed to be hooked up for the engine run. So right here, I was faced with a choice. I could not say anything and send the engine to the dock so it could be shipped to the customer, make the PO date. Or I could hook the perimeter up and rerun the entire test and run the risk of the engine not passing on performance. I chose the latter, uh, not only because it was the right thing to do, but my reputation was at stake. I did not want to be known as a guy who sold a bad engine to our customer who happens to be the United States military. I knew that I would have to stay late and get the engine up to the dock. It was a small sacrifice to make in comparison to the sacrifices made by those who serve and depend on good engines on their airplanes. The engine ran and passed on performance again, this time with greater margin than before. I stayed late, made sure that engine was on the dock for the next shift to prep and send to the military. I went to bed that night, dog tired, but I slept good knowing that I made the right decision. That is all for now. I hope you enjoyed this critical thinking presentation.